this leads us really neatly into another question that I have, which is that at the center of quantum mechanics is this idea that the uncertainty principle is not an artifact of measurement, is not an artifact of just how difficult these systems are to probe with the tools that we have available. It's that it is literally a fundamental principle of nature. Yeah. And I'm like, I've, I've tried this analogy out before, the, it's like the throwing a rock at a football, where it's if you're trying to take a picture of a football and you're doing it with a camera that throws rocks, you can probably only figure out position or momentum each time that you throw the rock because you destroy the trajectory of the football when it meets the rock. And so when we're doing experiments that look to see whether or not the uncertainty principle is accurate, what we're doing is we're doing the like, detector equivalent of throwing a rock at a football. And so we destroy the system. But the same way that you can take a radar image of a hurricane with light and actually like see the system without destroying it, it's because the wavelength that you're using to probe it is at a different scale than the system itself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that, I think, was pretty standard, um, the pretty, like, the pretty, like, st standard interpretation of, of the uncertainty principle for, um, for a long time. And this is, I think, one of the main things that Bohr was saying for a long time, um, which is basically what, what you were saying. Like, we can't, we can't ever escape this need to um, disturb the system. And because we can't ever escape the need to disturb the system, all of these profound things kind of like follow along from it. Um, but it's interesting because he stopped talking like that after the EPR paper. Because the EPR paper basically showed that you should be able to violate the uncertainty principle with like entangled particles going off and you just measure one of them. And now you should be able to deduce with probability unity, uh, the state of the other one, even though you didn't disturb it at all. So I, I don't really have, um, I don't have a pat answer about this. I feel like the, there's, I don't fully understand the uncertainty principle and like how it actually um, interacts with things and what the right way of thinking about it is. But my own current thinking in term, thinking of it is consonant with what I generally try to do, which is to connect things to, um, to like the broader context, right? Like if you know that there's something that's very, very trustworthy that you don't want to get rid of in the broader context, which actually is relevant to uh, what you're thinking about, then that can help you um, find your way. And this is one of the reasons why I like think about history so much and and think like kind of general things. But the thing about the uncertainty principle is that it's not like unique to quantum physics, right? It's actually a feature of Fourier analysis. Like it's a feature of putting things together with lots, lots and lots of wave modes. And um, there's a part, I think you didn't get to it yet, Nastia, but there's a part in the book that where I talk about how the uncertainty principle also applies to audio sampling, which it does, right? And Bohr, in his like famous Como lecture in 1926 or 27, that's that was his fundamental point about the when he finally discovered complementarity, right? It was he used telescopes as an example. It had nothing to do with quantum physics. It was like this very well-known trade-off in actually telescope design, where you have like a certain um basically uncertainty principle between um two quantities, right? Where they can't ever like the product of the uncertainty of both. Um, can't ever be smaller than a certain number. So I think that in my own opinion, I think that's probably the right way of thinking about it. Right? Can you break down the audio sampling thing for people? Okay, so the um, basically you've got two things. Um, 
you have the um, um, you have like the position of a wave train coming in, and then you have the frequency of the sound. Okay, so if you have total understanding of the frequency of the sound, like you know with um, total certainty what the tone is, middle middle C, whatever it is, right? What that corresponds to is a sine wave of a very specific wavelength going off forever in both directions, right? Which means that its position is totally, completely undefined because it goes off to infinity in both directions, okay? Similarly, if you take a whole bunch of different frequencies and add them together, you can get the actual sound disturbance to bunch about a specific point. So you add more and more and more and more and more and more, you know, frequencies until you get like your, your chirp actually just happens at a moment in time. So you know exactly where the sound disturbance is, right? Um, then you have so many modes, you don't know what the frequency is anymore. Like you basically have infinite uncertainty in the, in the frequency, right? So that's the uncertainty principle. It, it like, it, it's, it works for audio. Like it, it's basically Fourier analysis. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's other, there's like the discrete, I think the way that I, the place that I first noticed this was the discrete Fourier transform, which is the, maybe like the most used computer algorithm in the world. Um, it's just very, very useful for all different sorts of things. And um, the discrete Fourier transform has an uncertainty principle in it. And it can, is. Can you that. just tell people what that is really quickly? I mean, we've probably all heard of it before, but. Oh, it, is it, is the, it fair? The, can I just summarize it as like the ability to deconvolve a complex waveform into its constituent frequencies? Is that a reasonable? Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say convolve, but yeah, basically. What you do is you, you have two different like domains. You have like a time domain or a space domain and then like a frequency domain. And the two of them go back and forth where like you can represent your thing in one domain or the other domain. So you, in, in just in Fourier analysis, you just have wave modes like I was just describing and they're continuous. Um, and you have an infinite number of possible frequencies and you can add them together. You can add an infinite number of them together and then you create a subsequent waveform um, which has a specific shape. And you can create, this is, what so you can like make an orchestra out of a bunch of pure tones, basically, or backwards, I suppose. In fact, that's the only way you can make an orchestra, is out of a bunch of pure tones. Yeah. Uh, and like for like the audio nerds, all of us musicians out there, this is basically how equalization works, right? You get this, you know, if you see like a parametric equalizer, you get bins of all these different frequencies that your music is representing at any given instant, which are necessarily inferred because they're instantaneous. And it's basically just this simple... Fourier transform. I don't know if it's simple or not, but it's some pretty it's pretty simple calculus. There's a, there's a whole bunch of um, functions that are defined on this space once you set it up. And the discrete Fourier transform is like the easiest way to understand it because you can make you can do all of the math with like a finite number of modes. Like you don't need an infinite number of frequencies, right? Um, and and then like you do have convolution, and you do have um you know, like modulation and all of these functions that you can define on your mathematical object. And they wind up when you're thinking in terms of audio, they wind up having specific effects like bandpass limiting, right? You just cut off, you like just th like cut off all these frequencies um, or like shifting harmonic distortion, all this like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. All of it is basically just functions that are defined on this particular mathematical domain. 